Okay. okay. What I want to talk to you about is called modern physics. Modern physics wow. is considered physics that has happened within the last hundred years, within rounding, right? Within rounding. So what we're really starting with is in the late 1860s to the 1880s into the turn of the century, right? And I only know that because I look those things up because I don't actually know those numbers. I have to remind myself every time I teach this what was going on in terms of the order. Like 1905-ish? 1905 is the major one. That's the Einstein discussion. But there are a few things that happened prior to that that I want to explain to you and explain how interesting and how important they are foundationally to our understanding of pretty much everything, right? So the first thing is that... Einstein was born in 1879, right? So 1879 to 1955 is when he was alive, right? So right around this time. Before Einstein, in 1860, 1864, I only know that because I looked that up two minutes ago, there was a, uh, a mathematician. When did Einstein die? 1955. This is appropriate because we just finished waves. And the, the concern, of course, is that in the 1860s, what light was, was not obvious, right? And so there were competing discussions as to whether or not light was a particle, right? Which we have already identified as a photon, right? And as a packet of energy <coughs> um, that would act like a particle, right? And so in this idea, photons and electrons and protons are all essentially the same, right? They're small particles, they act as particles. They carry momentum, they move with velocity, acceleration, and so forth, right? But they, they are considered to be tangible physical things, right? And with understanding waves and wave theory, which you now understand, there was some indication that light might be a wave where it will diffract and refract in similar fashion to sound and ripples in water, right? Very similar to what we just took a test on. This discussion is hardly being uh, put forth by a number of scientists, a number of physicists, and a number of mathematicians around the world, right? Today? And no, or, okay. at, at this time, 18, 1860s to the, to the 1900s. Yes. Okay, got it. Okay, so after Isaac Newton, right, which is more like 1560 instead of 1860, right? Isaac Newton, studying physics, invented math that we now call calculus, right? Isaac Newton and Heinrich Leibniz, Leibniz invented calculus is really what happened, right? And so from that model, a guy named Maxwell was studying the mathematics of fields. And something we have not talked about is what a field is. And this is actually uh, something that's relatively difficult to grasp, but you can imagine that we've, we've talked about gravity, right? Gravity is potential to fall, right? But what's interesting is that gravity exists without an object to fall, right? Right? Which is why we know that the object put in space doesn't matter, its mass doesn't matter, because what's actually happening is the Earth is creating an attractive force field around it that causes things to pull towards it, right? So a field is the extension of force into space with the potential to affect whatever comes into that space. Gravitational fields are the first and foremost important, but a second one that you're fairly familiar with is magnetic fields, right? The fact that a magnet is always attracting the opposite pole of other magnets, even if there are not actual magnets nearby, right? Make sense? Okay, so why Maxwell is famous is because he used mathematics, calculus, and invented some other further extensions of calculus through his own design in order to explain electric and magnetic fields, right? Field theory. 
This toolbox called Maxwell's Equations is foundational information to explaining fundamental particles, right? Because the fundamental forces obviously would carry fundamental fields, right? Electric and magnetic being the most major. Gravitational, of course, is the other. And then somewhere deep inside the nucleus, there would also be strong and weak nuclear fields. What Maxwell did was do a number of rather complicated mathematical derivations to show the interlinking of those fields from the four fundamental forces. And he came up with some uh, equations, the set of equations called Maxwell's equations, that basically explain how the fundamental forces work, right, at the quantum level using fundamental particles, quarks, uh, electrons, photons, etc. A consequence of Maxwell's equations in 1864 was the fact that through his derivations, he was able to derive the speed of light. This was the first time the speed of light was calculated. Right? This was done what we call theoretically, in the sense that he did it on paper with math and did not actually tangibly measure light anywhere. Right? He did it based on the interactions of electric and magnetic fields. And his presumption in that analysis was that light was not a particle, but was something much more complex that, for some reason that he had yet to understand, had to do with electric and magnetic fields. In other words, light was a consequence of the electromagnetic force, right? the fundamental force. Yes? Yes, a force is once we actively bring something into the field, right? Okay. So, let me show you. Although it's round, this is a magnet, right? And the magnet has north and south poles, right? And so although it's round, you can see that the ends are damaged, right? You can see where it's been stuck to a number of things that the coating has actually come off on either side, right? This magnet has a magnetic field around it, right? That is the extension of the possibility of sticking to something metal, even though there is nothing metal nearby, right? Force is the activation of that field with another object, okay. right? Exactly like the Earth itself has a gravitational field all around it, but we don't call it the force of weight, gravity, until an object falls. Right? And so the idea is, is that even if there is no object to fall on Earth, that field, the potential to fall, still exists. And the same thing is true for the magnet. Right? Just because it's not near something metallic doesn't mean it's not attracting metal things. Make sense? All right. So for reasons that we're not going to get into in terms of math, Maxwell hypothesized that light was a consequence of electric and magnetic fields. <laughs> the math is extremely complicated. The reasoning and the hypothesis is extremely complicated such that me, let's call me a basic physics teacher, right? I don't have the depth of knowledge to explain much more than what I just said, right? I've worked with Maxwell's equations a little bit in college, and I got C's on most of those tests because they're very difficult, right? Nevertheless, in the calculation, Maxwell derived the speed of light, right? Something like 2.99 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, 300 million meters per second. But what was interesting was that depending on a few changes to the formula, right, he expected the speed of light to change through the der derivation. And what actually happened was even changing other variables, it was necessary for the derivation that the speed of light always be 300 million meters per second. This is contrary to the relativity principle. And he did not have an explanation of what that, why that was, but he said that the only way for this math to work is if the speed of light is 300 million meters per second. Now, in order to understand that, 
we need to back up and make sure that you understand what the relativity principle is. And this is actually something that you and I have covered, right, at the beginning of the year, throughout the year, and it's a fairly easy thing to understand, right? If you are in a car going 60 miles an hour down the road, right, if you throw a ball out the window, right, the ball is moving forward at 60 miles an hour because it was in the car, the ground is not moving, you throw the ball out the window. If you throw it just sideways and not forward, it's going forward at 60 miles an hour. If you throw it forward, then the speed of the ball across the ground would be 60 miles an hour plus however fast you threw it. That's what relativity is, right? That makes sense. Well, the issue, of course, Maxwell hypothesized, is that light, for whatever reason, doesn't obey that rule. So if you are in the car going forward at 60 miles an hour and you shine a flashlight, although they didn't exist in 1864, forward, the speed of light moving forward would be 300 million meters per second, not plus 60 miles an hour. If you were moving forward at 60 miles an hour and pointed flashlight backwards, the speed of light going backwards would be 300 million meters per second, not minus 60 miles an hour. This is a problem, obviously, because the relativity principle is how we shape reference frames. The reason why we can talk about the car moving at 60 miles an hour is because we are ignoring the fact that the Earth is rotating at seven, 900 miles an hour while also revolving around the sun at thousands of miles an hour. Right? If we did not have the ability to isolate reference frames, then that would be a much, much harder comp calculation, computation. Does that make sense? Okay. So... That being said, right, theoretical, 20-some years later, a set of experimentalists at a university in Ohio, which I can't remember which one, um, a set of scientists, experimentalists, named Mickelson and Morley, set up an experiment to measure the speed of light experimentally, right? So rather than doing a bunch of math, they're going to measure the speed of light. Right? Surprisingly enough, um, the way they did this is actually not too complicated to understand. You can imagine just the way we would measure the speed of anything else. right? We would send it out and back, time how long that takes, right? and do distance divided by time. Now, of course, the speed of light is very fast, so they were shining a light over a very long distance, right, from, from some place, off of a mirror someplace far, far away, and back in order to get... Yeah? Fantastic, right? The discussion was, if light is a wave, then there must be a medium in which the wave would propagate. Exactly like sound does not exist in space, because there is no air for it which to vibrate to create compressions and rarefactions, right? These are all words that you should now know. But light exists in space, and so the thought was there must be a medium that exists that we have yet to discover, right? This medium was referred to as ether, A-E-T-H-E-R, and it was considered to be a universal medium that we had yet to discover, right? And the idea was, of course, that if ether existed, then ether inside of a train would be moving at the speed of the train, and therefore the light would obey the relativity principle, and Maxwell was wrong, which is absolutely positively possible because some people make mistakes in math. I'm sure you can relate to that, right? Great question. What yes. kind of medium is this? This would be the medium in which light propagates. Wait, who? Mac Maxwell Mickelson and Morley. Mickelson, Mickelson and Morley. Is this <coughs> real around? How long ago? All right, so this was Mickelson <coughs> and Morley. They're wrong, right? They were in the U.S. and Ohio in, in the 1880s. 
20 some years after Maxwell's equations. Right? So what they did first right, was just shine a light off of a distant spot, measure it back, and they were actually able to calculate the number that Maxwell came up with within significance, right, 2.99 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Right? So the fact that that number matched up to Ma Maxwell's equations made sense. So then the next step was to take their light source and put it on a train and have the train move during the experiment. And so the idea would be that they would get the speed of light plus the speed of the train if it was moving in one direction and the speed of light minus the speed of the train if it was moving in another direction. Does that make sense? All right. They ran this experiment many, many times, and what they ended up with was a null result, meaning that that, in fact, did not happen. And so experimentally, they proved that the speed of light was a constant value. This allowed them to argue that ether was a myth. And in fact, light must be much more complicated than anyone had truly understood, and that Maxwell might be right in his analysis because Maxwell was describing light as a much more complicated interaction of electromagnetism. So the null result happens in the 1880s, and now we have theoretical understanding of the speed of light from Maxwell and experimental understanding of the speed of light from Michelson and Morley, right? So M, M, and M. Right? Okay, so all of that happened while Einstein was working math on mathematics and his theories in Berlin. Right? What's amazing about this... He lived in Berlin? Yes, Einstein was German. He was? He was. Why did he do that? He did. Oh, okay. And I read this just before we got here. He left to visit the United States in 1933, and then with the rise of Hitler during that time, he never went back the war was in 42, right, and so he just stayed here and became a, whatchamacallit, citizen. Okay. Nationalized immigrant. Okay. Right. Okay, so what's amazing, right, is that Mickelson and Morley were working here in the U.S., and Einstein was over in Berlin, in Germany, right, and Einstein was unawares of Mickelson and Morley. Nicholson and Morley had come to this result in the 1880s. They had just started publication of their paper. It had not reached Germany yet. Einstein had not read about it yet, right? So Mickelson and Morley supported Maxwell, and Einstein did not know that. Einstein had read Maxwell's papers, right, being the leading mathematician on the, on the forefront of physics. Einstein read his papers and was questioning this idea of the speed of light being a constant value. So <laughs> no, the, thing, actually, the thing that made Einstein amazing, right, is Einstein, <clears throat> being Einstein, was not an experimentalist, right? He did not work like Michelson and Morley on experiments to measure things. Instead, he did what he called thought experiments. He used his brain to think through what would probably happen without ever actually building or touching physical right. objects, right? Yeah. This is why Einstein is regarded as quite brilliant, right? It's because he was able to just think and figure things out. So in the early 1900s, after reading Maxwell's paper, which at this time was, what, 30-some years old, he was questioning the constancy of C, which is the speed of light, and thinking about what that would mean for the world, right? For the universe, in fact. Right? So he just accepted that the mathematics of Maxwell was probably right. And if that was the case, then that meant that the speed of light was a constant value, regardless of reference frame. And so if that is true, then there would be fundamental consequences to the universe based on this result. Right? And so what Einstein did is he just accepted that as a reality. And so, after reading Maxwell's, Maxwell's papers, right, equations on all of this, Einstein asked him a basic, asked himself a very basic question, right? He said, Einstein said, what 
what would I see? I rode a light ray. That's not possible. Right? The fun part about thought experiments is that they don't have to be possible because you can imagine them. How is this music it's saying it's like a genius? If you yeah. just sat there and thought about things, didn't right. actually do that. This is why I'd it's be like me that's sitting there and think form about science getting up and like doing the dishes, but I don't actually do that. And yet when you're done, you've created a Nobel Prize winning theory, right? Absolutely amazing. This is why Einstein was such an amazing person. <laughs> I'm confused. confused. Did so, you just like make up like new things? Yeah. Like that How did you know if it'd be right? Like, like you can't like, prove it. Like, 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 sometimes you like, really think something's thought of and, and then you go and like yeah. test it and it doesn't end up working out. Like how did he just But he didn't test it. Think about something that doesn't exist. But he's not testing it. What? Exactly. So as any good theorist would, right, like Maxwell, I thought he was they, a theorist. he's a theorist, not an experimentalist. Oh. Theorist is someone who thinks of things, write down math, and then just assumes they're right, uh, publishes really the paper, nice. and then guys like Mickelson and Morley build real devices to tell them that they're wrong, right? Or eat their pride and accept that they were right. Didn't Maxwell like wrong. actually derive it out loud? Right, using math, right? So we're going to do that in just a, just a minute. The point, of course, is that accepting that the speed of light is a constant value, then if, right, this is basic basic answer, is that if I, Einstein, am able to sit on the front of a light wave <coughs> and light does not obey the relativity principle, then from the front of the light wave, I can't see anything because light is how you see things, oh, and if I'm moving at the speed of light, I wouldn't be able to see anything in front of me, right? And so based on Maxwell's explanation of what light is, Einstein hypothesized that what I would actually be able to see is that perpendicular to the direction of propagation, I would see an oscillating, inversely related electric field and magnetic field. And this is actually the standard ex explanation of light according to Maxwell's equations, that light itself is an oscillating simple harmonic motion of electric fields. As the electric field <coughs> decreases, the magnetic field increases and vice versa. And so what's happening is that perpendicular to the direction of propagation, there are two things vibrating electric field and magnetic field. And those two things are perpendicular to one another and perpendicular to the direction of propagation. And so what Einstein said is that I would see electric and magnetic fields oscillating in space, but not in time. In other words, I cannot see forward and I also do not experience time. This is hard it's to understand. Travel because it's not so much time travel as it is pause, right? In the sense that from that perspective, time itself does not exist. Wait, but like, what if you're in a cave, no light, you still have time. In a cave you you're would. You're not moving with the light. But if you were moving at the speed of light, then time itself breaks down. And so, what Einstein was really indicating there is that time is a function of the speed of light and not the other way around, right? We think of speed as being a function of distance divided by time. What Einstein is beginning to touch on is that due to the constancy of the speed of light, time exists to accommodate light, not the other way around. Exactly. So, so light was like, oh my God. So what's he, what he's actually getting across here is that it's not time that came first. It's light. It's then light, light was the time's cause of light. Wait, what? Exactly. <laughs> Wait, time travels in the future. Correct. I didn't like know. light had to like get there and like create stuff and move. We're going to talk about it because I you actually time travel time. all the time. Okay. Right? <laughs> what we are doing right now is time traveling. Okay, we are moving thing. forward in time. Uh, but what's living. remarkable about this is that is 
strictly a function of light, right? And if we go back to your universe fundamentals and you think about what it is that causes us to interact with the world around it, right? It is the bosons, the messenger particles that transmit the forces. Well, the main boson that it transmits electromagnetic force is light. You cannot see things, you cannot touch things, you cannot interact with things without light carrying that information out, bouncing off of something and coming back to you. So light determines time, not the other way around. Could you time travel back? That's so weird. We're get to that, right? Okay. So what that means... Oh, yes. we had a project today. If, if you, like, so let's say since you're traveling at the speed of light, light is, like, paused. So if you travel, like, faster than the speed of light, would you travel, would you go backwards? All right, so <clears throat> I, I don't, I don't want to get into that just yet. Okay. Right? Did I jump ahead? You did. You Are jumped you ahead like, just a little bit, right? So what this leads to is what is called the special theory of relativity. Or for short, special relativity. This is opposed to general relativity, right? Which is something a little bit different that Einstein also developed. <clears throat> special relativity basically took the physics that we already understood, relativity, right, the relativity principle and everything I just talked about with a car going 60 miles an hour, and said that that is absolutely positively true, <coughs> except that he added a second rule, and that is, that is absolutely positively true for everything except for light, right? And so basically he took light and separated it from every known understanding of the universe and said that light itself is particularly special, right, and must be separated. This is why it is called the special theory of relativity. So postulate one is that the relativity principle is absolutely true. Relativity principle is that physics works in any reference frame, right? It works whether or not we're sitting stationary and I throw you a ball, or we're on a train moving at 60 miles an hour and I throw you a ball, right? We can do projectile motion in both reference frames by ignoring the outside universe because as long as you're moving at a constant speed, nothing changes, right? It is true that in accelerated reference frames, the rules change, right? If I am speeding up while I throw the ball, then how the ball moves changes, right? But that's something slightly different. So the relativity principle was held true, and then he just added the constant C of C, lowercase c which is, of course, the speed of light. Is that E equals MC squared? Yes, we're going to get to that in just a second. Right. And the idea, of course, is that really what makes the theory special is this addition, right? the constant C of C. And that's basically the fact that light propagates through space, empty space, with no medium necessary, at 300 million meters per second, and does not obey <coughs> rule number one. Right? It is essentially special. Pretty much out of time. So we will get to um, the interesting meat of this theory tomorrow.